Good morning. Welcome to our Boardwalk Talk series <clears throat> brought to you by the Estuarium at the Dauphin Island Sea Lab. My name is Mendel Graber. I am one of the educators here at the lab. And this morning we are going to chat with Dr. Jennifer Bloodgood uh, about some of her work here at the lab. Dr. Bloodgood is a PhD DVM. So she is a research scientist and veterinarian and uh, she works with our marine mammal group and she also does some work with the aquarium here uh, taking care of, of some of the animals here. So she is going to talk to us a little bit about her work here at the lab and then a little more specifically here at the aquarium. So with that I am going to let Dr. Bloodgood um, tell you about her work. Thank you. Let's see. There we go. Thanks so much, Mendel. Hi, everyone. It's really great to be here today to talk to you about what I do here at the Sea Lab as a research veterinarian and all the cool research that I get to work on, as well as some of the cool things I get to do with our estuarium. And later we're going to talk about a specific case that I've been really excited to work on here as well. So. But a little bit of background about me, as, as Mendel said, I have both a DVM, which is a veterinary degree, and I also have a PhD. Um, so I did my undergraduate and a master's degree in wildlife biology, so learning anything and everything about free-ranging wildlife. And then I actually went into the workforce and worked for a couple years as a researcher and as a veterinary assistant. And I found out that I was really interested in all things wildlife health. And so I decided that I really wanted to go back to veterinary school, but that I also was still so interested in research that I wanted to get a PhD to be able to do my own research and, and lead my own projects. So I went back to school, I went to the University of Georgia and I actually did a, a dual PhD DVM. So it was a long term, a lot of school, uh, but uh, I did my PhD on, on sea turtle nutrition um, and integrative conservation was the title of my degree, so conserving things um, in the wild. And then I went to veterinary school after that. And I'm a little bit different from your typical veterinarian. So most people think about you know veterinarians as working with cats and dogs or horses and cows. Uh, but I've always been interested in alternative veterinary medicine. So free-ranging animals, um, animals that are typically seen in zoos and aquariums, uh, not your normal cat and dog species. And as I said, I've also always been interested in research. So now I have a job that is like the perfect marriage of both of those things. I get to do research on free-ranging wildlife and also serve as a veterinarian for our group. So as Mendel said, I work with the Marine Mammal Research Program, which is actually, it has three branches in it. So I work with the Alabama Marine Mammal Stranding Network that gets to respond to all marine mammal strandings for the entire state of Alabama, and also to manatees in both Alabama and Mississippi. And then I also get to work with our Manatee Sighting Network, which keeps tracks, track of manatees in the Gulf and I also get to work with our, our third group, which is the photo ID group, which um, keeps track of various dolphins in, inside Mobile Bay. So I get to do a lot, a lot of fun things. Um, and if you were able to catch our last boardwalk talk, I spoke with our stranding coordinator, Mackenzie Russell, about what we do on the stranding side of things with the Alabama Marine Mammal Stranding Network. So, we respond to all marine mammals in the state, as I said. Um, any animal that is in distress, sick or injured, we will respond to. And whether they're live or dead, we will go out, assess the situation. If an animal is deceased, we actually bring it back to our lab and conduct what's called a necropsy, which is a post-mortem exam or an autopsy for an animal. And the purpose of that is to find out why the animal died and to learn as much as we can about these animals so that we can then protect them uh, in the wild. So that's kind of what I do as, as a veterinarian, but I also get to do 
research and I get to teach, which is really exciting. So um, one of the things I teach, I teach a marine mammal course for undergraduates and graduate students, which I'll be teaching this summer. Um, actually for the first time because I have been here almost a year now. I just started this position in the summer of 2020. So I'll be teaching my first course this summer. And then I also get to teach and mentor students. So we take interns um, as well as volunteers when, when it's not COVID time. So we welcome volunteers um, on a normal basis. And I have a photo here of me showing, this is inside of our necropsy lab. We're actually working on a dolphin uterus. So this is from a female dolphin and I'm showing our assistant stranding coordinator, Christina, who is here and one of our interns, Jess, from last year um, and talking a little bit about the female reproductive system in dolphins in this picture. So, um, so one of the exciting things I get to do is, is teach and mentor. And then I also get to do research. So one of the research projects I wanna tell you about is one that I'm working on with our stranding coordinator, Mackenzie Russell. And the top image there is a map, which actually shows some of the stranding hotspots that we have. So we looked at 40 years worth of data. So Alabama has been monitoring marine mammals for over 40 years now. And the stranding network is actually celebrating our 10 year anniversary this year. So we've had 10 years of really dedicated stranding response and 40 years of stranding response in the state in general. And this map has all 40 years. And on the left, you can see the bottlenose dolphins. And you can see that there are three hot spots, and they're named here. So we have Dolphin Island, Fort Morgan, and Orange Beach are actually what we call hot spots because more dolphins strand there than in other places. And that's specifically for the bottlenose dolphins. And the reason that we think that is, is actually sort of a combination of things. We think one of the reasons is the flow in the bay. So uh, the way that the water flows actually predisposes things that are floating to end up in certain places. Um, and we also think that it's because these areas are big, mostly sandy beaches uh, and populated areas. So we think people are more likely to see them and to report them in these areas. The map on the right shows a fourth hot spot for uh, actually non-bottlenose dolphins. So these are all the offshore species that we get. So in Alabama, we mostly get strandings of dolphins but, or bottlenose, but we also get other species. Um, and this includes some of those offshore species. So the Gulf Shores hotspot is actually a fourth hotspot specific to those offshore species. And we think that that's actually likely because of the, the shape of the um, ocean and the ground there. It's, there's DeSoto Canyon is a deep area that might potentially funnel some of these offshore species to this area. Another cool project that I wanna share with you, um, which is the last one I'll go into detail on, is our freshwater uh, work that we're doing. So dolphins are very susceptible to developing skin lesions when they're exposed to fresh water or very low salinity water for long periods of time. And there's still a lot of questions about um, how long, what salinity, what other things may happen to them. Uh, so we're trying to answer some of those questions. And the photo on the bottom is actually a photo of an animal that stranded last year and had some very severe freshwater lesions. So you can see his skin is not pretty. It has some big erosive, so it's going through the layers of the skin, lesions. And that's actually because he spent too much time in freshwater. And one of the charts that I wanna show you on the next page is showing, so in green here, we have the discharge. So Mobile Bay actually receives some of the most discharge in the country of fresh water into the bay because it's one of the largest systems in the country. So the discharge in 2020, actually that we had a 40 year flood. So it peaked at the end of February 
And you can see the salinity here in blue had a trough or an extreme decrease right after the peak of freshwater discharge. And then overlaid on that are some strandings that had freshwater lesions. And you can see in April, we actually had 13 animals that stranded with freshwater lesions. So this was a really big deal um, for us as the stranding network. We had many, many dolphins, more than one a week that were stranding with freshwater lesions. So we're doing a lot of work to figure out what we can do to mitigate these things potentially in the future and to learn more about why these animals are developing these lesions, what else is going on, and what we can do potentially to help. So, What, what are some of the possibilities? For example, is there um, a bacteria that thrives in freshwater or low salinity that's present? Or That's a great question um, and f sort of follows nicely. We, we're doing another research project on the microbiome of the dolphin's skin and how it might change. So microbiome, if, if you've heard of it, is in, in people, we look at a lot of like the gut microbiome and how it changes with what we eat and things like that. So we also look at the skin microbiome. So all the bacteria that naturally live on your skin and serve as a protective barrier to pathogenic or bad bacteria. Um, and so one of the things we're looking at is how the flora or the bacteria are changing with exposure to fresh water. But we do think that these lesions actually allow entry for bad bacteria to come in. So um, yeah, it's not, it's not a great thing for, for these dolphins. And we are looking at you know potential. We've, in the past, they've actually relocated an animal that was in too low of salinity um, so that that animal didn't develop these lesions. And so. it's interesting that they don't move out of these areas it is. of water. Is there any idea about why are they? So with animals that um, are, are kind of, they stay in a particular area, we might say that they have high site fidelity. Mm -hmm. um, so is there, do you have any idea why they're not just moving out of these areas of low salinity themselves? We're not entirely sure. Some mm -hmm. of the questions that we have are maybe they are staying in these waters because of food resources or something like that. Um, we do know that actually the adults are the ones that are more likely to strand with lesions. So maybe it's something about needing to be in these areas to care for calves. If, if the females need to stay in low salinity with their calves or something like that, it's a lot of questions that we still have left to answer. And Matt has a question. Did the other members of the straining network see a similar spike around the same time? So I'm assuming like the larger straining network. Um, yeah, that's Alabama. good question. So uh, for anyone who, who doesn't know, we are actually part of a larger straining network, which uh, includes everybody in the Gulf. So from, from Florida all the way to Louisiana um, and, and Texas even. And we all work together to respond to strandings. and this particular year 2020 was really kind of specific alabama had the worst of 2020 but 2019 was actually a declared um unusual mortality event or ume is what we call it with marine mammals um in mississippi so uh there are other areas in the gulf do experience this but 2020 was uh, just really rough for alabama in particular because of mobile bay and it's uh, how it receives so much fresh water because it's so large. And that seems like a pretty quick um, like period for that effect to show up with the, with the spike in fresh water and then the spike in strandings. Yeah. So it, it looks like, you know, if there's that correlation there that it doesn't take very long for the, the, the dramatic health effects to so yeah, up. so one of the questions that we're actually hoping to maybe be answer, maybe answer, but it has a lot to do with how low the salinity gets and how long they're in that salinity, how long it stays low salinity versus changes. But we did calculate that it's about a six to nine week transition. So from the amount of freshwater discharge to animals actually dying can be as short as six to nine weeks. Now that's um, definitely 
uh, impacted by an animal's pre-existing health conditions and things like that. So there's a lot of uh, factors that go into this, but it could be as potentially as short as six to nine weeks. And there are people doing studies on this freshwater issue is not a problem only in the Gulf of Mexico either. There's been studies uh, off of Australia and other places too. So a lot of people are looking into, into what's happening with this. So there are um, a lot of questions to answer, say, you know, about the amount of discharge, uh, you know, so if, if there's a good bit of discharge, but it doesn't hit a certain threshold, so maybe you're looking for that threshold or, so, you know, it's just um, still a whole lot of questions to be answered, <laughs> so you all are, exactly uh, have some um, hypotheses some some things to investigate but still a lot of questions about what's going on i i exactly I take. yep yeah and it might be exciting down the road to do once we've done some of this microbiome work to do another boardwalk talk we have a, a master student who's going to do some of that research so that might be something exciting to share with the public in the future and any results that we get from this research are you collecting samples from healthy um healthy individuals that so, so you can create like a baseline for a yes microflora yes amazing question um so we actually have an active the microbiome project is super exciting because we're looking into some new techniques and things but um we work with noaa the national oceanic and atmospheric administration and we actually go out on the bay um, and in, in the Gulf and we go over to Perdido Bay and do biopsy samples of healthy animals and from these biopsies we're actually able to swab and look at the microbiome is, is one of our goals. Um, so those would be healthy animals and then potentially as well if we see any freshwater lesions on those animals we can look at how fresh water might change that. And then we're looking at stranded animals and how, how it's changing with, with them as well. So, yes. Do you, because there is some seasonality to these pulses of fresh water that flow into the bay, do you see any, um, like these animals probably maybe you're not associating fresh water with these health problems. So, you know, they may not leave because of, of that, but uh, any kind of like evolutionary um, movement of the animals that would seem to be, uh, you know, that a response to these seasonal pulses of freshwater. That I mean, this we so part of our photo ID work actually is is looking at movement of the dolphins specifically here in in Mobile Bay, Perdido Bay, and, and the Gulf, and how whether we're trying to actually learn a lot more about how these dolphins move and whether they move some we think maybe stay here some may migrate in between places um, but yeah that's, I mean that's another great question that we're trying to figure out if if they are moving in relation to to the freshwater yeah I'm not sure I <laughs> asked that question very well but I didn't mean like any particular individual that would respond to that but it's sort of like a, a trend in the population movement Yes, I mean, that's a great question and something that I think we will learn from from the individuals mm -hmm. too, potentially, yeah. But can I go back and ask a question about your map with the mm -hmm. Of course. So, uh, you did note that, that part of the reason that more stranded, more stranded animals are found is because of people using the beaches, so mm -hmm. um, can you, sort of separate out the effect of, of the actual number of animals stranded versus the number of animals found? Do you have high confidence that those, uh, the animals that are found in these hot spots, uh, you know, there's a strong correlation between the number of animals that are actually stranding? That's a great question. So one of the things about relying, so we rely on the public to report strandings. Um, which is, is great. We have a hotline, it's one eight seven seven whale help that people can call for us to respond to strandings. But we know from previous research that actually probably somewhere around only 2% of animals that die are actually reported um, because they get lost in the marsh 
they never wash ashore, things like that. So how would an estimate? How would you come to an estimate? Like that? <laughs> there's there's different ways. Um, one interesting way that people do that is to actually put out fake things or previously stranded things and purposely know where they are and then go back and see how many people report those animals and what percentage of them are reported. Mm -hmm. um, we've never done that in Mobile Bay, but it's something we're actually talking about doing. So uh, it would be interesting to know what our success rate is with with our strandings. But this, the map actually, it, it only represents things that we actually responded to. So that's a great point is that, I mean, we could be missing 90 something percent of animals. We don't really know. Mm -hmm. um, if they never get reported, then we, we never know. So, but we know from the ones that do get reported that they end up in these hot spots. And so on, the, on this map, was that, was that um, total like the bottlenose dolphins plus the offshore or was this just the offshore? Just the offshore. So the offshore have the same three hot spots as the bottlenose dolphins plus an additional hot spot in Gulf Shores. So you offered an explanation for why there might be the hot spot for the offshore species here. Mm -hmm. But why would you not have a hot spot there for the dolphins? Do you have an idea? Yeah, I mean, so we think that actually, so this hot spot is actually on the Gulf side of, of Gulf Shores. So um, that's why we believe it's mostly, and it is mostly influenced by those offshore species. And I think that's, has to do with the flow for the bottlenose dolphins. So we know that the way that the water moves in the bay, we think that's actually how the Fort Morgan one is, is so prominent with the bottlenose dolphins is because of the flow. Um, and then the Gulf Shores, that's why we think it's the bathymetry or like the shape of the ocean floor uh, is because of that canyon there and it being influenced by the offshore species. Do you find more of the dolphins on the north sides of these, um, the peninsula or the island or on the south side? Both actually. So on, on the west end of, of Dolphin Island, for example, we find a lot on the Gulf side and, and on the sound side as well. So about, I don't know, maybe equal. That's a great question though. I'd have to, I have, have to go back and look at that. And Elizabeth has a question. When you say offshore species, what are some of those species? That's a, a great question. So historically, we do get mostly bottlenose dolphins, but we also get a lot of Stenella, which are in the spotted dolphin group. There's several different species that we get here. We've gotten Kogia, uh, melon-headed whales, there are Brutus's whales and rice whales in, in the Gulf, but we've, we haven't had one here in Alabama, but that's a possibility. Um, but yeah, that's, that's a lot of the, the offshore species that we've seen in, these, in this 40 years worth of data. So besides the mammals, some of the work that you're able to do while you're on campus also crosses the street into our aquarium. Yes. Yes, so um, something that I want to share with everybody today is actually an, a really exciting case that I was asked to consult on with one of our cow nose rays. Um, and the aquarists here at the estuarium are all super amazing. And the, the rays here have an aquarist named Logan, who I'm going to get to introduce himself here uh, before, we, before we get into the case. So let me can do this. Hey guys, so my name's Logan. I'm an aquarist here at the Dolphin Island Sea Lab. Um, I'm one of the four people here that help take care of the cow nose rays. Uh, they're my main responsibility. Uh, so they're gonna be right here in the tank behind us. Just to give you an approximation of our tank and how big it is, it's about 7,000 gallons of water. Um, it is home to three different kinds of stingrays in the tank. Um, like Dr. Bloodgood said, we do have cow nose rays in here. We also have Atlantics and blunt nose as well. So I was asked to consult on one of the male cow nose rays who had some cloudiness to his eyes. And there's a lot of reasons that that, that can happen. It can happen in the wild. It can happen in captive animals. Um, so one of the things that we first did to try and figure out what might be going on was actually to swab the eye with a cotton tip swab and look at it under the microscope. 
and we found lots of bacteria on his eye. So one of the things that we were able to do was to treat him with an antibiotic. And um, Logan can actually talk a little bit about how he did that if, if you want. Yeah. <laughs> so part of the process of getting them out of the tank, um, we essentially set up with a kiddie pool and we took a pump of water and we just pumped water through the gills to make sure they were able to breathe. Um, this individual that we took out um, he was a little bit less active than most, um, probably due to the fact that his eyes were obviously bothering him. And so as we got him out, Dr. Bluga was able to take that swab and gently, I would touch the eye and collect the bacteria off of that eye for him. Thanks, Logan. And so for the, for the antibiotic, he was able to actually stuff um, an, a pill that was an antibiotic inside of the ray's food and, and feed it to him. So the ray didn't know he was taking any medication, um, but he did that for, for seven days and ended up having a negative swab after that. So all the bacteria was gone. Um, I do want to share, so we noticed that the ray was having some trouble foraging and thought maybe that he couldn't see very well, um, even though we think his eye is has reached, it's done, getting worse we think it's it's done getting worse but that he can't see very well so we invited a specialist a veterinary ophthalmologist which is someone who works specifically on eyes an eye doctor for animals um, to come over from Mississippi and that was Dr. Gall and I have a photo here of when he came to visit so we have a table here with all of the eye equipment which you may recognize some of we use a lot of the same equipment in animals as we do with people and then we have two tanks here this tank had medication in it that actually allowed the animal to be asleep for the exam so to be able to get a really good look at their eyes they actually need to be asleep so that they're not moving around too much so we medicated the water the animal was asleep and then we have this other tank here that had unmedicated water so that the animal could wake up safely in a different tank before going back with his friends in the big tank um, and the when fish so rays are cartilaginous fish um, they need to breathe with their gills so um, here in this photo the animal is asleep so he can't do a really good job of pumping water over his gills to stay oxygenated so here you can see this is the tank with the medicine in it and it has an air stone that's allowing some extra oxygen and i'm holding a hose that is pumping water over the gills to keep the animal oxygenated and we also here is Dr. Gall looking at the eyes and you can see that two people are holding syringes and actually pumping water into the sphericals and sphericals are an interesting thing that rays have. We actually have a preserved specimen um, that Mendel has here that you can see the eyes are on the side here and here is one of the sphericals and that's actually an adaptation that they have so that they can sit on the bottom of the ocean floor and still breathe. So their gills are actually on the bottom side. So their mouth is here and their gills run along either side here. And when they lay on the bottom of the ocean floor, they can't breathe very well through their gills. So their sphericals are an adaptation for them to pump water from above that's not covered in sand over their gills. Rays are related to sharks and, yes. so, and skates and um, sh even sharks that spend a lot of time on the bottom have spiracles. So not all shark species do, but those that hang out on the bottom, they have their mouths often on the bottom and their gill openings on the bottom of their body um, usually have these spiracles that help them breathe while they're resting on the bottom. So with the eye exam, Dr. Gall was able to confirm that our, our treatment had, had worked. So we had done both an antibiotic and a steroid actually to decrease inflammation in the eyes. Um, and he was able to share that that did work, uh, but that the animal likely couldn't see and may never be able to see. So something that we've been doing and that Logan has been very diligently doing to make sure this animal eats well and stays healthy is actually tong feeding him 
Um, and we're super excited that he has actually gained weight. I have one more photo for you. Um, this one here. So this is, is Logan and two of our other Aquarists who are weighing the ray. So this is a scale and the ray is here inside the net. And so we have been monitoring his weight and he has gained weight and is looking super healthy now. Um, so and this was done when you took him out the, the first time so with Dr. Gall. And how long ago was that? It's actually been done so multiple times so that we have a good record of how his weight is going. Um, we did it once before Dr. Gall came, while Dr. Gall was here, and that was in November. And then we've done it at least once since then to make sure that he's gaining weight and he has his follow-up actually a follow-up eye exam on friday two days from now so he'll get weighed again then and dr gall will examine his eyes one more time to make sure that they're you know staying stable and not getting any worse uh, which we're very confident that that's happening he's actually We've talked about weaning him off of the tongue feeding because he's doing so great that he has started foraging super well on his own. Um, and we're just really happy with his progress. So uh, Logan's actually going to, to feed him now just to show you guys how excited he gets, how they all get <laughs> with, with food. Um, and potentially he'll eat off the tongs to show you what that is like. So today they're getting two different treats. Um, so for food wise, we are feeding silver sides. It's just small chopped up fish. Um, we do it just so the food sizes are a little bit easier for them to chew. These guys will literally crawl across the bottom of the floor like a little vacuum, suck it up and keep on going. They don't stop really to chew they just keep on going. And then for our treats for our male cow nose ray, he's getting some squid. We're going to give him some whole squid and he's also got some herring down here that's chopped up as well. Um, our goal currently to make sure he stays up to weight is we try to feed him two to three percent of his body weight. Um, that's in Lou of making sure he maintains his weight and hopefully gains a little bit more weight. Um, so hopefully if he's hungry enough, he will eat all this for me this go. He does get fed three extra times a day on top of the feedings that we do in the morning and the afternoon for the tank as a whole. Um, so at most facilities, the guests have the ability to feed the animals. Here at our facility, we actually broadcast feed our animals. And so the first thing I'm going to do is take our silver sides. I'm going to throw it across the tank. I'll get underneath and look at him and see, make sure he's going down to the bottom eating the food. And then after he eats a little bit, I'll start offering him the tong food here at the window and we'll be able to see him suck it in like a little vacuum cleaner. So here we Logan, go. Logan, can you talk yep. about the process of weaning him from the tong feeding? So the most likely scenario for us is we're just gonna offer less food. I don't wanna cut him cold turkey because he, he kind of expects it. It's like his little <laughs> treat. Um, and so I'll gradually take that down. So typical feedings in the morning from feeding squid, I'll feed two whole squid chopped up sometimes. So that's four pieces. I'll just probably take one squid away and do that for a few weeks and then slowly take another half of the squid away and then work it down. Um, we do give him a variety of treats, that way he doesn't get tired of any certain things. So he'll get squid, shrimp. Um, we also do capelin and herring. So we just try to give him a variety of food, all making sure it's what it's supposed to weigh. But so gonna... as Logan broadcasts the food, um, we have a question for Jennifer from Matt. Do you believe that it was some sort of an infection in the eye from contact with something or more environmental? Um, and I have a quick okay. question to, to tail onto that. Is it only one eye? <laughs> Good question. So it was actually both eyes in this animal and there's a lot of possibilities. We think it could have been a combination. Maybe he had an infection at first and then there was something in the water. We don't really know because this can result from so many things. They could, it could have been a trauma event at first. He could have hit, but it's less likely because it was both eyes, but still possible. He could have hit both eyes on something and then developed an infection. Um, you know, there's, there's just so many things that it could have been that we addressed every possibility. So we took anything that could have caused trauma out of the tank. We made sure the water quality was all great, which it all was great. They do so many water changes and things to make sure that, that these animals have the best water possible. Um, and so, just for clarification, it was only one individual ray out of a number of the same species. So, um, you know, the, the rest of them did not have the eye issue. Could it be age related maybe? age related is definitely a possibility however the the extent of it makes us think that it was something more than that uh, but they 
we are actually not totally sure how old these animals are because they originally were wild collected and they've been here for eight to nine years. Eight to nine years. Um, so probably getting up in age for these animals, honestly. Um, so it could have something to do with it, but think that it was more, more than that to be the level that it was. Right, okay, here we go. So is that knocking a signal to the rays that you're about to yeah. broadcast, or are you just here. knocking it loose? <laughs> so I know Logan mentioned this, but I'm just going to point out again that Logan is watching these animals very closely. So he is watching to see that, you know, the individual animals are eating and to notice if any of them are not eating. And so, I, you know, I just want to offer some praise to our Aquarius team. They do a wonderful job taking care of the animals. And the fact that one of the animals here, um, you know, one of the rays had an issue with its eye should not be taken as a sign that that Logan wasn't doing a great job watching because he detected that early and they responded to that need to, um, you know, treat his eye and to take care of his, um, you know, nutritional needs. They, you know, he knew that the, the eye was also related to his feeding that, you know, that he was not, um, not eating as well, because likely because of his eye issue. And so, you know, he responded really Logan responded to this issue really well in bringing in the necessary help and and getting the ray the <laughs> the help that he needed. There we go. So we have a question from John. He wants to know: Did you culture or attempt to identify the organism infecting the ray's eyes? That that is a great question. We did not culture. Uh, they were, if you're familiar with with the bacteria, they were long chains of um, cocci that were gram positive so we think that they may have been related to um, staph staphylococcus or streptococcus um, it's possible that the bacteria were actually something from from the water and and not from the eye so it's something that we decided to treat with a broad spectrum antibiotic as as a just-in-case scenario that's a, a great question though. And Sarah asks, is it easy enough to tell the rays apart to know which one needs monitoring? Logan, what's your trick? <laughs> so everybody has a little bit different tell to them. Uh, so in this tank we have two boys, which are very easy to tell apart from each other. And then we have five girls. Um, the girls it gets a little bit trickier, um, but by looking at their tails, some tails bend a certain way, some tails bend the other way. Um, so we try our best to match up based off their tails. Uh, because other than that, there's really no way of telling them apart. Uh, sometimes during mating season, uh, there are bite marks that are left, and so we can tell a female, it's like, hey, this boy was definitely interested in her, and so we can keep an eye on her and see her progression and find out if she is going to give birth the next year. So have you seen the, male, the stingray who had the eye issue? Is he eating for you right he now? He is. He is eating very well. Um, I am about to offer him his treat because he's right here at the window looking at us. <laughs> he's just like, hey, I think there's something going on here. So we'll start off with the squid. I'm gonna step on the other side of y'all. So, so he will come back around here in a second. Let's see if I can get. And if you had another ray try to come along and grab that, you would just lift it? Yep. So everybody wants the good food. <laughs> He's hanging out over there in the shadows. Can rays smell food? Yes, they can. They have really good sense of smells and directions. So he just got that piece. Oh, so cute. So what so he typically does for us is he'll grab a piece of food, he'll swim around the tank, and he'll come back and eat another piece. He doesn't typically stay in the same spot too very long. So when you say when you say they have an eye 
concern when we talk about the fact that they're still able to smell and have that sense. Mm -hmm. So he's still able to keep his direction within the tank, correct? He is. So if you think about it, like if you have a blind cat or dog, those guys typically learn your house very well after they lose their eyesight. Same principle applies here in the tank. The tank doesn't change shape. He usually swims with his group of friends and they're really good at directing him too. Are you? <laughs> <laughs> um, and so this guy, every now and then we'll see him bump into things, but he quickly figures out, hey, I'm going the wrong direction. And he'll change it. The fact that he knows the window is here is a good sign for us too. Because he'll typically bump into the window and he's like, hey, I get fit, fit fed over there. And so he comes up here as this is his feeding point. You can see his spiracles moving too. <laughs> This next piece that I am feeding is herring, so you will see some blood coming off of it. It's a kind of fish. Yep. Chopped up. Just chopped up fish. Uh, Matt asks, do they have sensory nodes in their heads to know their surroundings as well? <laughs> they they do. So um, it's actually thought that they're that since their eyes the location of them are sort of on the side and and towards the top of their head uh that maybe they actually don't use their eyes that much for foraging because they typically feed on things that are that are on the bottom um, of the ocean floor so they actually may not even need eyesight all that much although this animal was was having some trouble finding food uh, but they do rely they almost have more, they have more senses than than mammals um, and they have those a lateral line like fish and sort of electrical stimulation that they're able to know more about their surroundings without using their eyes really so could his reduction in foraging have been more related to um you know a stress from a, an illness rather than the reduction in his eyesight definitely that's that's a great point um so when you know whenever you don't feel well uh you may not feel like eating sometimes so um he, he's still working on that piece of squid <laughs> um so it's possible that he just didn't really feel like eating um and less so that he wasn't able to to find it um it's also that's a good thing to note that it's a it's a positive thing that i mean he is foraging on his own so well right now that his other senses are definitely doing their job too so does he get full logan he does get full quite a bit so these guys if you think about like cattle grazing they'll eat a bit they'll walk on do something else come back eat some more um, that's essentially what stingrays do and so they forage all the time and so that's part of the reason why we feed him three times a day his extra food so he'll forage in the morning eat some of his treats and then we'll come back at lunchtime give him some more treats and that will pass him over until it's time for dinner it's interesting that the fish have no interest in the treats the um nope. the Making mullet yes Angel? yes well i've seen some of them come over and nibble at it but mullet generally are they eat algae they do love the, the algae on the sides of the tank. You'll see them foraging on that. <laughs> so I always like to point this out because I think that we all, uh, including those of us who know that stingrays are fish, have a ten and, and sharks, uh, stingrays and sharks are fish. We have a tendency to talk, to kind of separate them and talk about stingrays and fish. So I just like to point out that they are fish. They're in a different uh, group of fish. There's a mullet trying to eat that piece nice of mackerel. Nice. <laughs> um, so the rays and sharks are cartilaginous fish and the mullet in here and other fish that, that we more definitely recognize as fish are um, bony fish. They have bony skeletons rather than cartilaginous skeletons. And there's some other differences between the these fish groups, but they are all fish. It's really cool, um, really exciting. We have, we have one more question that, okay. that came up and um, Michelle asks, uh, and I think this is going back to when we were talking about your stranding. So she asked if pollutants were a possible factor. So I think that maybe she was asking about the freshwater inflow. So ah. I brought up, you know, one possibility that you might be looking at uh, with bacteria and the different bacteria that thrive in freshwater versus saltwater and how the freshwater 
you know, you mentioned how the mm -hmm. fresh water might affect the um, flora, the animal's skin, bacteria, the helpful bacteria on their skin, and how that then might allow either fresh water or salt water bacteria, you know, that cause, path you know, cause infections. But the, her question, I think, is maybe related to whether there are some pollutants that are flushing in with the fresh water. Exactly. That's, that's actually that's a great question as well. So with a lot of runoff um, coming into the bay, so it's, it's not just runoff, but it's, you know, melt and things like that coming into the bay. But with it, that extra influx, there's definitely the possibility of some contaminants and things coming into the water with it. And that's something that we monitor uh, with all of our strandings. We take samples for a whole slew of things, but contaminants is one of the things that we monitor very closely and is something that we will look at with our freshwater project to see if it correlates. That's a, a great question and a good point. And then we have one last question from Christina and she asked, does anyone ever get stung? Which I'm assuming that she's asking about the barbs. Mm -hmm. So Logan, can you tell us about the process? Uh, so here at this facility, we do trim the barbs of our stingrays. Um, if you think about the barb like your fingernail, it takes three to six months to grow back. Um, so when we trim them, we're essentially cutting a giant fingernail. Um, so our process here requires two aquarists to get into the tank at the same time with the animal. Um, we do it this way to help alleviate as much stress as possible because nobody likes being yanked out of their home. And so we'll get in there with the nets, we'll scoop them up. Um, one aquarist will hold the animal, the other one will get near the tail and clip the barb as easily and gentle as possible and then they'll just go on their way. Out of all the species in the tank, the only guys that typically mind it the most are our Atlantic stingrays. These guys are also the most common around the shores around the island. And so an interesting difference between those Atlantic stingrays and the um, cow nose rays with reference to their barbs. Mm -hmm. The Atlantic have their, well it's hard to see because they're clipped, but their barbs are kind of halfway down their tail. A lot of people I think think that the, the length of the tail is, you know, that there's a barb that that, that whole um, tail stings, but there's an actual barb that has been clipped on these so it's hard to see. But on the Atlantic, they're about halfway down the body, while on the cow nose, they're very close to the body. And they have a different habit. The, these two animals, these two species have different habits. So if you watch, just in this tank, the Atlantic stingrays do spend a lot more time on the bottom, while the cow nose spend a lot more time swimming. Um, so the, uh, <clears throat> the barb can be used more effectively um, if they're kind of down on the bottom and they're and they have something to push against. So to touch what Mendel was saying, uh, so the cow nose rays first line of defense is to outswim whatever's trying to eat it. Our Atlantics and our blunt nose they like to hide in the bottom of the sand and kind of bury themselves while big predators go over them. Um, so that's mainly reason why the barbs are really closer to the body on the cow nose ray and the barbs on the Atlantics and the blunt nose are further on are further down their tail. Um, a lot of people ask me when they come to see our stingrays, why do all the stingrays tails look different? Um, so as Mendel was talking about how some people mix up where the bar placement is, sometimes we do get fishermen down here that don't exactly know the anatomy of a stingray. And so a lot of times the practice is they like to trim their barbs. Um, that way they're safe when they're handling the animal. And so sometimes they actually snip the tail and not the barb. And so that is part of the reason why some of our animals don't have their full tail length. Now that tail doesn't really affect their swimming ability. Um, it does play some purpose into it, um, but for the most part, these guys learn to adjust and they get along just fine with their tails being a little bit shorter. Logan, we got a message from somebody that the audio cut out while you were explaining how the barbs are cut. So just a real quick synopsis to um, answer that question again so, about getting in the tank and 
and clipping them like fingernails. Yep. So we'll actually get in the tank here. We'll usually wear waders. We'll take a big net with us. We'll scoop these guys up. Um, we have some big cutters, little metal cutters that we actually trim their barbs like their fingernails. And so one Aquarius will typically hold the animal. The other Aquarius will get near the tail and we'll grab the tail just very slightly, lift that barb up a little bit and snip it off just like a little fingernail. And then as soon as it snips off, they're right back in the water out of the net. So it doesn't take long. It doesn't take long, maybe a minute at most. So um, do you feel like there's anything you'd like to um, make sure we kind of leave with as a main message? Uh, that's a great question. Any, I mean, I'd like to put out there that anyone who's interested in being a veterinarian, if you ever want to contact me or talk about volunteer opportunities, we're a little limited right now with COVID, but um, ultimately we we do take volunteers on a normal basis. So you're in, if you're interested in veterinary medicine or research and how these things go, definitely get in contact with us. Um, you can contact me directly at J Bloodgood, Jennifer Bloodgood. Uh, so it's J Bloodgood at Dissel.edu if you're interested in opportunities like that. Um, and we're just really excited to share all of the some of the research that we work on and some of the cases that I get to work on with with the amazing Aquarius here. Uh, so yeah, let us know if you have questions and, and things. And also, we hit on this really heavily at the last during the last talk, and you did mention it. Uh, the importance of those reports. So you were talking about, you know, stranded marine mammals, um, and you mentioned also the um, manatee sighting network. So, and, and you did mention that we rely on the public to report stranded animals, whether they're stranded alive or dead. They, they like to, you know, gather the information on the animals, even if they're stranded um, dead, and, and it's not, there's no potential to help them. And also, if they're in the water and they're, you know, they seem to be perfectly healthy and they're alive and they're moving, like the manatees, they're interested just in the in the information that they're there. So, um, if you are on the water and you see, or on the beach and you see any of the marine mammals, whether they're alive or dead, whether they're healthy, whether they're stranded, um, then we appreciate that you report that information uh, at. Exactly. So we have the 877 whale help number um, for the, the stranding network. So specifically for dolphins and whales, um, we are interested in any animal that is in distress, sick, injured, or dead. Uh, we respond to all of them. And then we also have the manatee sighting network, which we are interested in all manatees um, because a lot of people you know think that they only live in Florida but we know now that a lot of them actually live farther west live in Alabama live in Mississippi sometimes even farther west than that um, and so we're interested in manatees year-round healthy or not healthy uh, so please report to our manatee sighting network and Elizabeth Hebe is the director of that here at the C lab so um, yes, let us know if you see a manatee or if you see a distressed or injured or dead cetacean, so dolphin or whale. So thank you both for joining us this morning and thank you all for uh, tuning in and um, we hope to see you for the next boardwalk talk. <laughs>